Our text this morning is John's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 25 to 27. John 11 and verses 25 to 27. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. For the last three weeks, we have been looking at the profound and marvelous account in John's Gospel of Jesus' sick and dying friend, Lazarus, and how our Lord, in his sovereign, marvelous wisdom, decided not only not to heal Lazarus, but also to let him die. And after Lazarus died, Jesus stayed where he was even two more days before making the journey with his disciples to Bethany outside of Jerusalem, where Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha had lived. As you'll remember, when Jesus brought up to his disciples that he was going to wake Lazarus. The disciples were not eager to go with him back to the area of Judea and Jerusalem. Why? Because the last time they were there in John's Gospel, chapter 10, it recounts it, the Jewish leaders had picked up stones to throw at Jesus to try and murder him. And Jesus had eluded their grasp. And so they didn't want to go right back to the very place where there were people who the disciples knew were plotting against Jesus. And then, of course, they think also by extension against them as well. Yet Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem, Luke tells us. And as he's going back into the area of Judea and Jerusalem, in John's Gospel account, this is the last time he will be headed in that direction. He's going toward Jerusalem because he knows that about one week after the events that we're learning about in John chapter 11, and about one week after this is when he will die his sacrificial atoning death for the sin of the world. And so he goes there to do this stupendous, miraculous thing that we've been talking about. We haven't gotten there yet where he says, Lazarus, come out! This wonderful climax of John 11. We're not there yet, but it's been building up to that. And he goes and does this wonderful thing, like on his way to his own death, to pre-shadow, pre-figure what he himself is going to go through as he dies and rises from the dead. And when Jesus arrived just outside of the village and Martha had heard about his arrival, she mournfully came out of the house and approached Jesus and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We can hear the pain in her voice as she's saying this. Faith, but also pain. If only you had been here, Jesus. I, I know, I, I know you were able to, to heal anyone. You've done it so many times. Multitudes have been healed by you. If you had just been here, he would not be in the tomb right now. Yet she also says, even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And then Jesus replied to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha, even in her great sorrow and grief and despite her disappointment, still confesses Christ. 
and still confesses her hope in the resurrection, saying, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She has an eschatological hope that the tomb in which her brother is lying is not the final resting place. It's not. Those tombs which are behind our church, those graves, are not the final resting place for those people either. There will be a trumpet that sounds and those graves will burst forth and those who are lying there will be instantaneously in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, be changed. The Lord will will glorify those who belong to him and there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Even the unjust will burst forth from their graves as well to stand before Christ in judgment. That day is coming. This is what Martha is confessing here. That's why I do have to say, I'm grateful to God that I serve at a church that has a church cemetery. It's so important for us. It's important that there's a church cemetery. That the cemetery is not something which is so far away and separated from the church. Why? Because ours is a faith in a resurrected Savior. That's the reason why, you know, I, uh, when I die, I want to be buried there, behind this church, or even underneath this pulpit in, in the basement area where we were just doing Bible study. No, no, probably in the, in the actual cemetery, all right? Like that's, the, that's the reason why when I die I want to be buried there, because you know, that's where the saints should be, in the hope of the resurrection. We bury our dead in the hope of the resurrection. It's why when, even in the 18th century, when Christians were dying, someone went over to uh, John Wesley and said, it's amazing that your people don't mourn like the pagans. And he said, well, our people die well. Why do our people die well? It's because we have hope in the resurrection, that death is not the end. That's why Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that we should not mourn like those who have no hope, because we have hope. We have hope as Christians. We have hope that because he lives, we also shall live. Hmm. I'm getting ahead of myself. See, Martha believed the wonderful words of Isaiah 25, 7 to 9. That prophecy about the coming day when God will raise the dead and defeat death forever. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples. Even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces. And he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day. Behold this is our God. For whom we have waited. That he might Save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. I know of no more beautiful promise in the scriptures than that, actually. I think there's no more beautiful promise in the Bible than that promise. That our most fundamental problem, our greatest enemy, death, will ultimately be abolished. When Christ returns. Thank God for that. There was a woman who was dying at the old church that I used to serve up in Antioch, Illinois. Her name was Renee Yo. And as she was suffering with incurable cancer, it was horrible, horrible suffering she went through. But this woman did not lose faith in Christ. I walked with her through a lot of that, even uh, after my tenure at that church had ended. Um, I'd go and visit this poor lady as she continued to decline, and her cancer got worse and worse. And 
I went to her home on the day of her death. Um, I, of course, I did not know it was going to be the day of her death. I knew that she was not doing well, and hospice was there. And I, I went to her home, and I sat by her bedside, and by that time, she could no longer speak anymore, but she was awake, she was conscious, she could just not speak. And I read for her those verses from Isaiah 25, 7 to 9. And as I read them, she was crying tears and nodding her head, yes. And I said to her, Renee, this is true about you. This is your living hope. And she just kept nodding her head. And like five hours later, she was in the presence of the Lord. Right? This is the hope that we have. This hope that Martha confess to Jesus, I know that he will rise in the resurrection at the last day, is the hope of Christianity. It is our great faith. It is why we do not mourn like those who have no hope, and it is why uh, we do not um, need to be consumed with sorrow when our believing loved ones die. It does not mean that we do not have sorrow. I have to say that. It's important. The Christian life is not a life of stoicism. Paul doesn't say, that's why we're never sad. He doesn't say that. What he says is, this is why we do not mourn like those who have no hope. He doesn't say we don't mourn at all. Okay? Because as we're going to see in John's gospel, right here in chapter 11, Jesus himself is going to weep. We'll see that in just a couple of weeks, Lord willing. That Jesus weeps. At the grave of his friend Lazarus. Nevertheless, we have this hope that the covering that the covering which is over all people peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations, will be abolished. Death overshadows all of us. We feel its harbingers. We experience the funerals of others, knowing that our own is coming. And it is a veil which we ourselves cannot remove. Death is a champion. It's like a champion Olympic wrestler with which we all must wrestle and temporarily lose to. We all must. Unless Jesus Christ comes back, and I do believe in the imminency of Christ's return, that it could happen at any time. I do believe that. No man knows the day or the hour. There is some sense in which the return of Christ is going to catch everyone um, by surprise. For believers, it will be the best surprise ever. For unbelievers, the return of Jesus is going to be the most terrifying thing ever. And they will call on the mountains and hills, fall on us and cover us to try and hide from the Lamb. That will happen. It will be a surprise. But unless that happens in our lifetimes, we all must wrestle with this champion, death. And know that unless the Lord returns in our lifetime, we will lose our match. But that day of resurrection is still coming. And it is our great hope as Christians and we're going to be covering this more in the next few weeks, but suffice it to say that that glorious hope of future resurrection on the final day is what Martha was holding on to even after the death of her brother, even after her inability to understand why the Lord did what he did in allowing Lazarus to die. Right? She didn't say, well, I'm giving up everything now. I'm walking away now from the faith. That's not what happened with, La with, with Martha. In response to Martha's accurate description of what will happen on the last day, Jesus then explained to her that though she was waiting hopefully for the event of the resurrection to take place, the one who is speaking to her is the embodiment of resurrection. Jesus is the cause of resurrection. Jesus is the end of resurrection. He's the purpose of it. He is the resurrection. Our Lord responds with what are, in my estimation, if I might even put it in these terms, the best of all of his living words. At least my favorite, all right? If Christians are allowed to have favorite verses, John 11, 25, and 26 are my favorite verses in all of the Bible. Jesus says, I am 
the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? I want to spend um, the rest of our time together considering and meditating on and receiving this glorious truth from the lips of the Savior. In John's Gospel, Jesus makes seven so-called I am statements. Now, there's actually more than seven if we include things like Jesus saying to the Samaritan woman, I am he, when she says Messiah is coming, or um, when the soldiers are coming to arrest Jesus and they say we're looking for Jesus and he says, I am, and they fall down. Um, or when the Pharisees deride Jesus for saying that Abraham rejoiced to see his day, Jesus answered before Abraham was born, I am. So there's actually more than seven, but there's seven statements that he makes. And he makes these, these statements where he describes himself, sometimes metaphorically. We've looked at four so far, and today we come to the fifth. Here are the statements that Jesus makes in John's Gospel. He says, I am the bread of life, in John 5.36. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. I am the gate, John 10, 7. I am the good shepherd, John 10, 11. And here today, I am the resurrection and the life. All of the I am proclamations that Jesus gives are ultimately in reference to the fact that when Moses asked God at the burning bush, who shall I say sent me, God replies, I am that I am. So when Jesus repeats this phrase over and over, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection of life, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the way and the truth and the life. When he says these statements, he's doing two things. One, he's saying that he is the one who was speaking to Moses in the burning bush. It was Jesus. It was Jesus pre-incarnate, who was issuing forth his direction to Moses there um, as Moses was on the mountain. And secondly, he's revealing the characteristics and attributes of that great I am of Exodus. He's saying this is who the I am is. The I am is the bread of life. He is able to give life to all who come to him. The I am is the light of the world. The I am is the gate through which we must enter in. The I am is the good shepherd who put on flesh and dwelt among us. The I am is the resurrection and the life. He is. He is. And he is the same yesterday and today and forever. And he never changes. And he always keeps his promises. He is. When Jesus says, I am, it's because he always is. He's able to keep his promise because he is yesterday and he is today. And he is tomorrow and he is forever. And we need to remember that, ladies and gentlemen. We need to remember. We need to remember, no matter what happens in the election in four months, Jesus Christ is high and exalted, seated on his throne. The train of his robe fills the temple. And the, the angelic host is flying and calling out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. No matter what, no matter who president the president is, no matter if America goes up in flames, no matter if there's World War III, nuclear holocaust, no matter what happens, Christ is king. Christ is the king. He's the king over all the earth, and he has an infallible plan that will come to pass, and it's all for his ultimate glory and for the good of his saints. No matter what happens, that must underpin our entire worldview. Okay. Must, must underpin our whole outlook on life in this fallen world. Very well. So Jesus here tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Spurgeon points out, Martha looked upon the resurrection and the life as the things which were to be. 
in some dim and misty future. But Christ says, I am those things. I am the resurrection and the life. Not only do I get these things by prayer from God, but I am these things. You see, because the wages of sin is death. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Because death has cast its pall over Adam and all his progeny. Because Adam disobeyed God and did not heed God's word when the Lord told him that in the day that he eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would die. And thus all of his progeny die. We all die because we are in the line of Adam. We're born in the line of Adam. And all we need to do to see the truth of this is to read the very next chapters after Adam and Eve sinned. Genesis 4 and 5, first Cain slew Abel, first death of a human being. But then after that, we read the genealogical account of Genesis 5 and the sad refrain over and over, and he died, and he died. And he lived 800 and some odd years, and he died. And he had other sons and daughters. And this one lived so many years, and he died, and he died, over and over and over. Death awaits all of us. Listen to the words of Thomas Boston in his excellent book, Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. I've quoted it before, not this particular quote, um, but you all should read Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. It's one of my favorite books. Um, top three that would take to a deserted island, including the Bible. All right. Excluding the Bible, of course. Bible plus three more. This would be one of them. All right. Here it is. Boston writes this. All can see that wise men die. The foolish and the senseless alike perish. Despite the multitudes that came before us, there's still enough room on this earth for us. They have departed to make room for us, just as we must depart to make room for others. Death has been transporting men to another world for a long time. And countless multitudes have already gone there. Yet the work continues. Death still claims new inhabitants every day for the house appointed for all the living. See what he calls the grave? He calls the grave the house appointed for all the living. There's one waiting for you and for me. Who has ever heard the grave say, Enough! It has been collecting for a long time, but still demands more. This world is like a bustling fair or a market where people are constantly entering and leaving. The assembly is in chaos, and most do not know why they've gathered together. It is also like a town situated on a road to a great city where some travelers have passed through, some are passing through, and others are just arriving. Ecclesiastes 1.4, one generation passes away, and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Death is an inexorable, unstoppable messenger who cannot be swayed by the power of the mighty, the riches of the wealthy, or the pleas of the poor. You see that? doesn't matter how much money you have. you still die. You'll still die. You know, I'm old enough to remember Steve Jobs, the uber billionaire, if there's anybody in the whole world who had billions of dollars and could buy the very best medical care that money can buy, it's him. It was him, right? I mean, he, he could have a team of doctors living with him, right? And, and giving him gene therapies and all kinds of experimental drugs that no one else has access to. He could buy anything he wanted, have the best private jet fly him to wherever, to the Cleveland Clinic every day if he wanted to. And even that could not save that man. Could not save him. He's still in the grave. Death does not show reverence for the aged, nor pity for the innocent child. The bold and the daring cannot defy it, nor can the faint-hearted secure an exemption from this battle. So it's like, it's not as though, like, if I'm scared enough of it, then maybe it won't come. <laughs> no. <laughs> Listen, I, I, let me tell you that, okay? This is an important point. Now, I don't want to dwell too long on this point, but mm, there's lots of people who are really scared of death and try to do, like, 
have to eat health food all the time. And as long as I eat health food and take enough vitamins, I will push death further away. Like, really? Really? I mean, tell that to like the hundred year old lady who still smokes, you know? I mean, God knows the beginning of our life and he knows the end of our life. And it is, we cannot add hours to our day or our life by worrying. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Oh, who, who can add a single hour to his life by worrying? Oh no, I got to make sure that I do this and that so that I live a little bit longer. Just trust in the Lord. Okay? I'm not telling you to eat french fries and marshmallows every day. Okay? I'm not saying that. But I am saying that the Lord knows the days of our life. Okay? And we will not die one moment before the Lord's appointed time. Yet that appointed time is still coming and we do not know when that will be. All right. Suffice it to say that man's life is short. Man's life is short. It is not just a vanity, but a fleeting vanity. Consider how the scriptures measure the length of human life. Although it was once counted in hundreds of years, no person has ever reached a thousand. No one. Not even Methuselah. And that still uh, pales in comparison to eternity. Now, hundreds of years have been reduced to scores. The maximum length is 70 or 80 years, maybe 90 years. But few reach such a milestone. Death rarely waits until one is bowed down by old age to claim them. As if years were too generous a term for such a brief existence on the earth, our lives are measured in months. Job remarks thus, the number of his months are with thee, Job 14.5. Look at that, the number of his months, just months. Our journey is like that of the moon, completed in a short time. We're always waxing or waning until we disappear. Often our lives are counted in days, and even then there are few. Job says again, man that is born of woman is of few days, Job 14.1. Now, so not just centuries, not decades, not months, days. In fact, scripture reduces it to a single day. A hired worker's day who diligently observes when their workday ends and ceases their labor. Our lives are even compared to a moment, 2 Corinthians 4.17. Although our light affliction may last a lifetime, it is but for a moment. A light momentary affliction. That's what Paul calls it. In another passage, it's reduced even further. As low as one can possibly go when the psalmist declares in Psalm 39.5... My age is as nothing before you. My age is as nothing. Similarly, Solomon mentions a time to be born and a time to die, but he does not mention a time to live. Think about that. There is a time to be born, there is a time to die. As if our life was merely a leap from the womb to the grave. And moreover, consider the various similes used in Scripture to convey the brevity of man's life. Hezekiah describes his age as being removed from him like a shepherd's tent. You are comparing it to a weaver cutting off a completed piece of cloth. The shepherd's tent is swiftly packed up. The flock can't graze, graze in one place for long. So if you're a shepherd and you have a tent and you're in a field... Look, I was in um, Romania and each morning I could see... This shepherd with his flock, and he had a tent out there, and the flock would be in that field and go out and come back. And then in the afternoon, the flock would be in that field, and the shepherd's tent would move over to the other field. Just didn't even in the same day that would happen. Here today, gone tomorrow, like a weaver's shuttle moving with incredible speed, going up and down. My dad used to collect antiques. Mike, you remember in the, in the house there was that big wheel that was like a black wheel and, and then underneath the wheel was this like pedal. It was like a, an iron pedal that you could push with your foot and as you pushed it the wheel would go faster and faster and faster and faster and me and my brother would like go underneath it and like try to make it go super fast and, and the, the shuttle like super, super fast shuttle up and down. And, and if you're uh, someone who sewed, a sewer, I don't know, 
what do you call that? Seamstress or whatever. You take like a cloth, do, 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 do. each one of those, the weaver shuttle. It's like the moments of our lives, our lives passing, 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 passing like that. How these truths cause most men in the world to despair if he spends any time thinking about them at all, which is the reason why the modern man doesn't want to even think about this. Tries to set his mind on anything but this reality. So then what hope is there? What hope is there? None but this alone. Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Though it is true that the wages of sin is death, it is also true that the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And not only does Christ have authority to raise the dead, he is the resurrection from the dead. He says, I am the resurrection. What does this mean? It means that by the virtue of Christ's incarnation, that is, his taking on of human flesh, because he is a human being who is our substitute. And because he himself rises from the dead on the third day after his crucifixion. Thus all who trust in him shall also rise with him. Because he lives, we shall live. He is the resurrection. He's the cause of resurrection. He's the meaning of resurrection. He's the one who implements our resurrection. Outside of him, there is no resurrection. If Christ is not raised, there is no hope. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if we trust in Christ in this world only, we are to be pitied above all men. If we don't have hope in the resurrection, our faith is a faith which is focused on the resurrection of Jesus. It is central to Christianity. Central. That if the death and resurrection of Christ is not the focus and, and emphasis of the church, then it has the wrong emphasis and the wrong focus. It's not the message of the apostles unless it's this message. Okay. This is the message of the church. This is the reason why when Paul goes to Athens, the people say about Paul, Paul is preaching foreign deities, plural. What foreign deities? Well, because he kept talking about Jesus and the resurrection, Anastasia, the resurrection. And they thought, well, oh, there must be one deity called Jesus, and there's some, someone else called Anastasia, the resurrection, and he's preaching like these different gods. Okay, no, it's because the resurrection was so much on Paul's lips, he keeps talking about Jesus and the resurrection. You must trust in Jesus and the resurrection. That people... Got a misconception and thought, what does he mean? Well, he means Jesus' resurrection. That's how often the resurrection of Christ was referred to by the early apostles. It's central to our faith. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 22. If Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, even Christ, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is what Jesus means when he says, I am the resurrection of Outside of Jesus and his resurrection, no one is raised because the wages of sin must be paid. What a profound reality is contained here. This is the reason why Paul preached Jesus' resurrection so constantly. Because he met the risen Lord and was convinced that there is zero hope outside of him and his resurrection. 
look further. Jesus does not stop at saying that he is the resurrection, but that he is the resurrection and the life. He is the author of life. He alone has life in himself, and he is able to bestow life on any whom he chooses to. This is why the apostle writes, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain, because in Christ is life, real life. Christ is the one in Genesis 2 who breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And he did that to Adam. He has done that to you and to me, both physically, if we trust in Jesus, and spiritually as well. And this is why Jesus continued to tell Martha, He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe? That's the question. That's the question he asked to Martha, but it's the question that he's asking to us. He's asking to you. Even right now, even 2,000 years after he said these things, do you believe this? Is Christ your only hope? Jesus lives and so shall I. Do you believe this? Given the nature of the resurrection, the first part is easy enough to understand. We believe, if we believe in Jesus, our mortal bodies will be raised up after death. But what about the second part, that everyone who lives and believes in me will never die? How can that be the case, given the fact that Christians die every day? And the Christian was shot and killed at the Trump rally just a few weeks ago, Right? couple of weeks ago. A Christian died there. So what does Jesus mean when he says that we will never die if we believe in him? It means that the temporary separation of soul and body is here regarded as not even interrupting, much less impairing the new and ever life, everlasting life imparted by Jesus to his believing people. That's what it means. We will never die. It is as D.L. Moody said. If you ever heard this quote, Moody um, wrote once, Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher, that is all, gone out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body like unto his own glorious body. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the spirit in 1856. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the spirit will live forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right. What it means then is this, that for the believer in Christ, all death is is a chair of state to usher us into the glorious presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that the moment of our final breath will be the moment that we open our eyes to a much greater and more beautiful reality in the kingdom if you know him, if you trust in Christ. And you will breathe much sweeter air and your soul may be separated from body for a time, but eventually the trumpet will sound and that body that is buried out in the church cemetery will be recreated and resurrected and glorified and join body and soul together in heaven with God forever. And there will be no break in the life of the Christian. Listen, he who believes in me has eternal life and has passed from death to life. You have eternal life right now if you trust in Jesus Christ. You have it. And listen, if you have something which is eternal currently in this present tense, you will not lose it. You will not lose your life because you, if you trust in Jesus, you have eternal life. This is what Jesus says in John 3. 
Whoever believes in me has eternal life. If you have something eternal, you can't lose it. If you could lose it, then it wouldn't be called eternal. It demolishes the definition of the word eternal. If you could lose it, it would be whoever believes in me has temporary life. Whoever believes in me has conditional life. Or whoever believes in me has life until he dies. No, no, no. Jesus says whoever believes in me has eternal life. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is the hope that we have as believers. This is how those 21 martyrs could go on the beach with ISIS as they have a knife to their throat and they're about to cut their heads off. Just, just re recant of your faith in Jesus and you will be saved. We will let you go. They would not do so. Why? Because they knew that they have eternal life. Cut their head off. Their life does not end. They will be transported into the presence of Jesus by the wicked person's knife. You see that? Jesus asked Martha, Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that he who believes in me will live even though he dies? The question Jesus asked Martha in essence is, Do you believe that I am the Lord of all creation? That the hope of resurrection is not found in anyone else but me? Let us behold the faith of Martha as she answers, Yes, Lord, I believe. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And we're going to close with this. How I long to meet Martha someday. I, I want to meet her in heaven someday and tell her how much her confession of faith has blessed me. Me, personally. In the darkest moments of my life, Martha's confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, parallels Peter's confession in Mark 8 and other places. But whereas Peter confessed his faith in a time of relative comfort, who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal these things to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter made that confession and said that the Father is the one who revealed this truth to Jesus. Martha makes her same confession. I have believed that you are Mashiach. You are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And she makes that confession in the valley of the shadow of death. That's when she says it. In her darkest hour. And her most vulnerable, filled with so much sorrow, having watched her brother take his final breath, having sent word to Jesus, and Jesus not showing up. Having faith that even then Jesus could still do something, but he hasn't done the thing yet. Despite all of those things, Martha says to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How beautiful that is, despite all of her sorrow, all of her disappointment, all of her inability to reconcile what she thinks Jesus should have done with what he actually did. Martha's faith in Jesus did not waver. She confessed three profound things here I want you to see before we close. One, that Jesus is the Christ. Um, means that she believed that he's the fulfillment of all the messianic prophet promises of the scriptures. In other words, that Jesus is the one who sits on David's throne forever as king of kings and lord of lords. She confessed that about him. You are the king of kings and lord of lords. You are the one who is promised in the Bible. You are the one who God said, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. You are he. Two, she confessed that Jesus the Christ is also the son of God. What an amazing, astonishing Christology this woman possessed. Here she acknowledged not only the triune nature of God, but that Jesus is the divine Son incarnate. You are the Son of God, the unique Son of God come to the earth. 
And three, that's it, that he has come to the earth. She confessed he is, that Jesus is he who comes into the world. That Jesus is not like anyone else who ever lived. Why? Because everyone else who ever lived comes from the world. We are made of the dust of this world. We are part of the world. We are born in the line of Adam, whom God molded from the dust and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He is an earthly man. We, by nature, are earthly men and earthly women. We come from this earth, but Christ is he who comes into the world. He comes down from heaven and assumes a true and perfect human nature. That's who Jesus is. He is a divine person who assumes upon himself a true humanity, a true human nature. He is truly divine and he is truly human. I confess, Martha is saying this. Martha, a woman. <laughs> All right, listen. This woman, in the midst of her grief, confesses you're the Christ. You're the son of God, and you come into this world. You've come here to be the savior of it. That's what she's saying. That's what she's saying. It's, to me, like maybe the profoundest confession of the scriptures, or at least one of them, one of the most profound confessions in all the scriptures of faith in Jesus is issued forth in uh, John eleven twenty seven. Like that one, like the thief on the cross, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know, I can think of some like that. This is so wonderful, so amazing that Jesus is not like anyone else who ever lived. He came down from heaven to earth and was born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. How wonderful is Martha's faith. It is the most evangelical confession in the midst of the darkest conditions of her life. And soon she would see that what she confessed would be proven true. Jesus really is those things. And he shows it by raising Lazarus from the dead. Let us ask the Lord to give us that same kind of faith that Martha exhibited in our passage. That we would be filled with the same Holy Spirit to enable us to believe these things. That when Jesus asked the question, do you believe this? That we also would be able to say, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we're so grateful that you are the great I am, who is also our only hope, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. You give us hope of eternal life, a living hope. We are born again into this living hope. We're, we will not be disappointed because you are alive and you are able to keep all of your promises. And I pray that these living words would sink down into our heart, that you would bear fruit in us, that you would enable us as your people to live lives in the light, the glorious, shining, beautiful light of this truth, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that this life is not all there is, that the grave is not the end, just a temporary receptacle until that time when Christ comes to reign forever and ever on the earth. And I'm so grateful that this is a church filled with people who do believe this. Help us then, Lord, to live in the light of the consequences of these things. That you would help us, give us uh, resurrection hope in our lives. Help us not to despair despite whatever happens in the world, but to be filled with the truth of this promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.